Welcome back. If we have not met, my name is Dan. I'm the pharmacist here at MD Custom RX. Last week, we had a live seminar in the pharmacy that was talking about mitochondrial health and two new test kits that we have available here to help improve mitochondrial function and to help the patients look at genetic SNPs that they may have variants in their genes that might predispose them to the, the inability to produce ATP efficiently. Now with mitochondrial dysfunction, the problem there is that that can lead to a multitude of different symptoms, especially neurologically. A lot of our energy is consumed through our brain tissue, essentially. So with all the videos that we have on Methylene Blue, which helps to basically rescue Complex 4 in the electron transport chain, this video is, I think, critically important for those that are looking to help improve their energy function if Methylene Blue hasn't done that for them already. So in today's video, we're going to look at some very key uh, over-the-counter supplements that might be helpful. So let's get into today's content. Stick with me till the end of the video. I'm going to be sharing with you something else that we're going to be talking about next week that is a critical fat-soluble vitamin that also can help improve the electron transport chain. So the first supplement that we're going to talk about is CoQ10. I'm sure most of you out there that are in the functional medicine space and the holistic space already know about CoQ10. Our body produces coenzyme Q10. I think of coenzyme Q10 as the spark plug to our engines, to making ATP. Now that's probably an oversimplification, but think of coenzyme Q10 as one of those cr key critical enzymes in helping to produce ATP. As it talks about here in this slide, I'm just gonna read this here. CoQ10 transports electrons from cytochrome one to cytochrome and cytochrome two into cytochrome three in the electron transport chain during cellular respiration. And in that, we need CoQ10 to move these electrons around. So in this test kit that we have available, there are two genetic variances that, again, you may have that can predispose you to not moving electrons around efficiently enough. And essentially what this test kit is looking at is, well, would you be a candidate for supplementing with CoQ10? Now, certainly if you are taking a statin drug, in my opinion, we've seen this in the research, that statin drugs can inhibit the enzyme that helps our bodies produce CoQ10. And so it's this HMG coase reductase enzyme that gets inhibited by statin drugs, which then reduces our cholesterol production. But it's that same enzyme that helps our bodies to produce and manufacture coenzyme Q10, now we're inhibiting that. So if you are on a statin medication, I would encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider, talk to your doctor about the possibility of supplementing with CoQ10 to help offset this deficiency that these statin drugs can possibly have on your physiology. So here's another point. You might be taking coenzyme Q10 and just not absorbing it, right? So the key point here is if we have this genetic variant and we're not absorbing CoQ10, well, again, maybe we need to increase the dose or maybe we just need to move in a different direction. So this is something to look at where, oh, you're taking CoQ10 and you think that it's working for you or you're taking it and you're not seeing the benefit. Well, you may not be absorbing it because you have this genetic SNP, this defect in your DNA. So that is something uh, critically critically important to think about. The other important thing that I like to point out about the absorption of CoQ10, about cholesterol, which again is important to have, our body makes it for a reason, and dietary cholesterol, again in my opinion and that of many others, is not the culprit when it comes into cardiovascular disease. That's really inflammation. But the point is, is we need a proper uh, gallbladder and liver essentially to produce this bile to store it in the gallbladder these bile salts these emulsifiers help our bodies to absorb the cholesterol from our diet the vitamin e the fat soluble vitamins and, and coq10 that we can obtain from our diet so just make sure if you don't have a functioning gallbladder like we have a lot of patients here that come into the pharmacy their gallbladder is actually removed uh, because of gallstones and, and different issues of there of course point I'm trying to make is that if you do not have a properly functioning liver and gallbladder, 
to produce enough bile salts, you may want to, again, talk to your doctor about supplementing with some bile salts to help improve absorption of these fat-soluble vitamins. All right, so enough on CoQ10. Think of CoQ10 as the spark plug of that engine. Let's move into oxidative stress. So when we're talking about mitochondria, we're talking about methylene blue, the problem there is when, we, when our bodies produce ATP, just like in a car engine, there's exhaust, there's metabolic waste that we need to get rid of. These oxygenated species that are very reactive, so the ROS, that can cause more DNA damage and cellular damage. We need to get rid of all of this metabolic waste uh, in an appropriate fashion. So I'm just going to read this here. The oxidative stress imbalance of free radicals and antioxidants can lead to the impairment and damage of mitochondria. So if we get overloaded with rust, so to speak, using this car analogy, our bodies are going to become rusty from the inside out, and we're not going to be able to function as well as we would want to. So this particular part of the test looks at three different genes. And again, if we have these deficiencies, we may want to explore the option of, of supplementing with more antioxidants. So the second gene that this test looks at is something called SOD2, super oxide dismutase 2. This encodes for a mitochondrial enzyme that converts superoxide into hydrogen peroxide and oxygen for initiation of mitochondrial detoxification. So again, if we have this variant of SOD2, we might have a buildup of superoxide, which ultimately can lead to more oxidative stress in our bodies. And then the last gene that this looks at is called GPX1. This encodes for selenium-dependent enzymes for glutathione detoxification of peroxides. So something here to be aware of is looking at uh, glutathione levels and also looking at selenium levels. So if we are selenium deficient, we may not be properly taking care of these peroxides that possibly are building up in our ATP and in our, in our cells. Let's briefly look at some really basic diet and lifestyle strategies to improve mitochondrial function. So we're always talking about supplements to help improve our physiology, to improve our health. But there are some just basic things that we can do in our lifestyle, which as it talks about here is eating more leafy greens. So we can get B vitamins, we can get magnesium, we can get CoQ10, all from leafy greens. L-carnitine, we can find that from red meat. Alpha-lipoic acid, we can find that from, again, leafy greens, from spinach. Glutathione precursors, found in garlic and onion. So just changing some of our dietary habits can be very beneficial to our mitochondrial health. Something important to note about alpha-lipoic acid, going back to that one for just a minute, is there studies that have been shown on taking enough alpha-lipoic acid usually around 600 milligrams, can help uh, with weight loss. And alpha-lipoic acid can also help with possibly nerve damage. So some of these things have you know, two or three different benefits in the body. So again, I encourage you to call the pharmacy, talk to the, one of the pharmacists here. We can go through your, your medical history and find out which supplements might be best for you. The other thing too you want to make sure is that you're avoiding mitochondrial toxins. So some of the basic ones here, highly processed food, High fructose corn syrup can be very inflammatory. Artificial additives, trans fats, alcohol smoking, plastic pesticides, heavy metals, and I'm sure we can add to that list, but there's just a, a very basic list there of things that can be very problematic to the mitochondrial. Other things that are important to think about for improving mitochondrial health is doing intermittent fasting. So this is something that I'm a huge fan of and looking at, I'm, not the expert on this by any means, but just be aware that if you are somebody that's out there that is, again, struggling with mitochondrial dysfunction, a lot of fatigue, again, I would encourage you to look deeper into intermittent fasting where you're having this eating window of about eight hours, sometimes even six hours, um, sometimes even less than that. But I would say a feeding window between eight and six hours is probably sufficient for most patients out there. And that can help to act, activate autophagy, as it says there, stimulate, which is basically just getting rid of the old cells is the easy way to, th to think of that. Stimulating AMPK, which promotes um, producing more mitochondria in our system. And then activating CERT1, which I talked about this uh, on the live stream, where CERT1 is helping with mitochondrial biogenesis and producing more ATP for our body. So CERT1 is important for that. And just by, again, not eating, 24 hours a day, like 
I know a lot of people out there, and myself included, I'm, I snack late at night, so shame on me for that. But just be aware, as best we can do here, just know once we start learning the rules of the game to help with anti-aging and helping to improve our physiology, well, then we can start playing the game correctly once we know all these rules or recommendations, guidelines, whatever you'd like to call them. Uh, managing stress, that's probably a no-brainer. Uh, Wim Hof breathing, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. So if you're not familiar with Wim Hof, there's a couple of books, more than probably a couple of books that he's written by now. I encourage you to take a further deep dive into um, his techniques to help with improving your parasympathetic outflow and reducing your fight and flight neurotransmitters and hormones and things to that nature. So just practicing some mindfulness, breathing can be very helpful. Obviously sleeping seven, eight hours a day is uh, very beneficial, can be very beneficial. And then those, 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 Hormetic stressors, I really like that. So the cold, going back to Wim Hof with cold plunges, cold exposure uh, for very short periods of time can be very beneficial in improving mitochondrial function. And then on the flip side of that, uh, saunas, uh, far infrared heat can be very beneficial as well for mitochondrial health. So then the next part of this test that we do offer here at the pharmacy looks at these essential vitamins. So I'm not going to go through these one by one, but just know that there's certain genes here. You can just read this for yourself on the slide and pause it. But looking at vitamin C, transportation, looking at vitamin E, metabolism and circulation, and seeing if your liver can properly manage vitamin E and so forth. So that's something to look at, possibly. Uh, and then magnesium. So something, too, that's important. We need proper magnesium levels for mitochondrial function and energy movement so that's also included in this test and we talked about selenium just a moment ago selenium is really important in helping with thyroid function so be aware of this as well if you're somebody that is struggling with hypothyroidism you may want to look at selenium levels you may just want to do this entire mitochondrial dna test to see if you have this snip for the di01 this encodes for a selenium-containing enzyme that converts T4 into T3. So something that is, I think, critically important to understand is that our bodies really run off of T3. Now, a lot of doctors will just test for TSH, and that's your thyroid-stimulating hormone that's released by your pituitary. The problem with that that I have is we're really looking at T3 and T4. That Those are the hormones that... Our, we have receptors all over our body for T3. And we really want to know what that level is when we get down to it. The T3 is really what's doing a lot of the action. There is some activity to T4. Uh, it is limited. So my point there is make sure you're, if you're hypothyroid, if you have issues with thyroid function, that you're testing more than just your TSH. Test the TSH, the T3, the T4, the free T3, the free fraction T4, and your antibody levels, in my opinion, anyways. Glutathione, we could do a whole hour talk just on glutathione, but just know that this test also looks at glutathione, uh, and there's different genes. There's four of them listed here that it looks at. Uh, and if we have an issue with glutathione manufacturing or the synthesis of glutathione, we may want to supplement with glutathione or go back to those the onions and garlic that I talked about that can help improve glutathione levels. The other vitamin that I have been looking at that is, in my opinion, with the research I've been doing on this, if you are taking methylene blue and it is not working for you, I would highly, highly encourage you to look at something called vitamin K2. Not vitamin K1, that really its main function is to help with clotting. I'm talking about vitamin K2. So I'm gonna be doing a video on this next week, but vitamin K2, has some very critical roles, roles in mitochondrial health and function and helping to produce ATP. Now, when I was first trained on vitamin K2, it was helpful for bone health and cardiovascular disease, which it still is. It helps to take calcium that vitamin D brings into the bloodstream and drops it off at, the, at bone tissue. Vitamin K2 also can help to remove calcification out of the arteries and, and our cardiovascular system and pull that calcification out of these soft tissues where it doesn't belong and put that calcium back, basically back into the bones where, where it really should have been in the first place. So vitamin K2 though, this new research is that 
It can help in the electron transport chain. The research isn't great on there on that, uh, but I hope more research does come out on K2 and its uh, effects on the tr transport train. But the other thing that it can help do is it can help with neurological dysfunction. So those patients out there with uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, there's some research that is being done with K2 and its benefits to these neurodegenerative diseases. The other th thing that is fascinating, in my opinion, on vitamin K2 is it, it can help. Research, again, is pretty fresh on this, is that it can help with neuropathy, especially diabetic neuropathy. The dosing there does range quite a bit from 100 micrograms in some studies all the way up to 300 or over 300 micrograms per day. Uh, so there's, again, a lot of research that still has to be teased out to see, you know, what patient populations are going to benefit from K2 and then what the dosing is and so forth that's going to be most clinically effective. So stay tuned for that talk, that video next week. Hopefully I'll have that wrapped up. And then tomorrow I hope to put together the talk on neurotransmitters as well. Well, that's a quick rundown on the some very basic nutrients, some basic over-the-counter supplements to help with mitochondrial health. So just a quick recap, we have CoQ10, we have possibly glutathione, vitamin C, vitamin E, magnesium, selenium. These are some really basic over-the-counter nutrients that may help you improve your mitochondrial function. So hope you found value in today's video. If you did, please share this with a loved one. We're trying to continually bring just really basic information to patients to help improve their health, to optimize their function, because there's a lot of misinformation out there, in my opinion, especially in the pharmaceutical world. We're trying to put pharmaceuticals on issues that are just a Band-Aid approach, where we'd rather fix the root cause of the problem. And I think a lot of this does come all the way back to the mitochondria that we were talking about today. So again, if you could please uh, subscribe to our channel, and if you found value in today's video, please leave a comment below on what supplement that you think may benefit you the most. And we'll see you next week regarding vitamin K2. Thanks again.